certainly you have heard people identify themselves as a recovering alcoholic or recovering addict. And this way of identifying themselves means something quite special, actually. It refers to a, a kind of liberation they've experienced, a, a bondage, a, a smallness, a sadness they've left behind. But in saying that they're a recovering alcoholic, for example, they're also giving you the awareness that, you know, it's always kind of one step away. And unless I'm faithful to this, it'd be very easy for me to be pulled back. So I have a friend uh, who refers to himself as a recovering perfectionist. And I'm really struck by that every time he says it, because for one, it's a kind of vulnerability, huh? <laughs> He's letting you know out in the open, like, this was my weakness. It's always kind of close at hand. But nonetheless, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Now, I suspect there might be a few of those among us today, huh? or we're just stuck in the throes of perfectionism. But um, I find that a perfectionist is wonderful to have on your team, like at work, just as long as their office isn't that close by. So they get a lot of work done, but it comes at a kind of grind and a cost. And the truth is nobody suffers a perfectionist more than they suffer themselves. Because think about the reality, huh? You don't live all that long and you realize, I've left a lot of things undone. And I have to carry the burden of my record. Oh, there's, a, there's a record. And I, and I really can't go untangle it. I can't fix it. And so that's a tremendous kind of bitterness, and it can be the cause of so much sadness, you know, a recovering perfectionist. So our scriptures today hold up a couple things, and we got to be kind of careful here, uh, knowing where we could lean. St. Paul says, hey, you're called to holiness. Everyone who's come alive to Jesus is called to holiness. You're called to be a saint. This is everyone, whatever season of life, whatever occupation, like you're actually called to holiness. Isn't that wonderful? There was a time, I suppose, in the church where we'd say, well, that's just for priests and religious. No, holiness is for married couples. Holiness is for single people. Holiness is for those in high school. What does that look like? It's for all of us. And Isaiah will take it even further. He says, actually, you're even called to be a light for others. If you're living your life in such a way, you will be casting the light of Christ for others to, to warm themselves and to be drawn into salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if we let perfectionism kick in, we will say, oh, no, <laughs> I'm so far. Where do I begin how do I go undo some of the things in my past, you know, that when I think of, they make me cringe. And, and maybe I remember them a lot with some bitterness. It certainly can't be that I'm called to holiness. Well, here's the thing. This is the subtle distinction that moves us to the gospel. You know what we often do unthinkingly with our perfectionism? We make morality the center of what Christ came for. Like, we, we subvert everything to morality. And so, all of a sudden, I'm like, the gospel is conditioned by how well I'm living virtue or not. But what is the gospel, really? It's a person who came, who remains with us, who won't give up on us. And this is where I think the first person to recognize Jesus, and he points to him, is so instructive. What does John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there's an invitation here 
So important is this invitation that it's included in the source and summit of our faith, the Mass, every time, the high point. The bread and wine's been consecrated. It's no longer bread and wine. Jesus is here. And we say those same words. Behold, look at him. Focus on him. Contemplate him. Be taken by him. Like he's come. And how has he come? Well, he's come as the Lamb of God. He's come to atone for what you can't atone for. He's come to make you one with God, one with others, that sin separates us, and even one with myself, where I feel so divided within, disgusted by some of the decisions I make. Like, look at him. One of my favorite authors has put it this way, and I can't tell you how many times this catches me in my own sadness of not living up to whatever standard I have in mind for myself. He says, quit dreaming about self-perfection and look Jesus in the face. I can honestly tell you we're coming up on a year of Eucharistic adoration, contemplation, stopping. Don't worry about activity. Don't worry about words. Don't worry about noise and just look at him. And the fruits are amazing. Like, it's our way of saying, Jesus, we want you to be at the center. Not our own virtue, not our own activity. And yes, hopefully, from you, beautiful things will happen. But we want to look at you. <laughs> we want to be taken by you. So I want to close with something I came across this week. We have some wonderful patrons here at St. Ambrose, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, by extension, St. Monica, and also St. Francis of Assisi. And having spent a number of my cherished months over in Italy, I can picture this scene so well. So Francis is walking along with Brother Leo, and he notices that Brother Leo is depressed. He's downcast. Kind of this disappointment in himself that he's carrying. And listen to what Francis says, and maybe he says it to you. Leo, listen carefully to me. Don't be so preoccupied with your purity of heart. Turn and look at Jesus. Admire him. Rejoice that he is what he is. Your brother, your friend, your Lord and Savior. That little brother is what it means to be pure of heart. And once you've turned to Jesus, don't Look back at yourself. Don't wonder where you stand with him. That sadness of not being perfect, that discovery that you really are sinful, is a feeling much too human, even bordering on idolatry. We will always have something to reproach ourselves for. Focus your vision outside yourself on the beauty, graciousness, and compassion of Jesus Christ. The pure of heart praise Him from sunrise to sundown, even when they feel broken, feeble, distracted, insecure, and uncertain. They're able to release it all to His peace. This is my favorite detail. After a long pause, <laughs> Leo said, Still, Francis, the Lord certainly demands our efforts and fidelity. Francis says, no doubt about that. But holiness is not personal achievement. It's an emptiness you discover in yourself. And instead of resenting it, you accept it. And it becomes the free space where the Lord can create anew in you. So here's for being recovering perfectionists and being able to gaze to behold the Lamb of God who's come, who remains, and who takes away our sin and the sin of the world.